Monsieur Bass qui va intervenir sur la High Categories and Topology. Et je, je voudrais le remercier tout particulièrement parce que il a bien voulu accepter de remplacer euh, Alain Badiou et il vient de Oslo. Donc euh, c'était quand même un, une flèche assez longue. Et, et donc je le remercie particulièrement pour, euh, pour sa présence. Well, uh, this was not a, a planned talk in any way. Uh, I was just just happened to be here, coming from the Erzman meeting in Amiens, and uh, Michael Wright just asked me to give a short, very brief account on some recent result and uses of higher categories in topology, and that's exactly what. I'm going to do. I won't give any results, just some uh, uh, results, but no, no proofs, just some kind of um, ideas. Because I think there has been a recent uh, very interesting development about higher categories. I must confess that even 15 years ago, if somebody had asked me about uh, the importance of higher categories in topology, I would have been extremely skeptical. But I have changed my mind. And uh, I hope to convince you by some results that there's really a lot of new topological information to be picked up in this way. So uh, I got some transparencies now, but from Amiens this morning when I was thinking about our talk, I had just four transparencies left. So they are a little bit dense and um, I may have to supply the information. But what the first thing I would like to do is to introduce what I'll call second order K theory. You know that ordinary K theory consists of vector bundles. You have a topological space, and to each point you associate a vector space. And basically what you do is that you let the vector space move around the space and you look at the automorphism group. And that produces normally to the general linear group, and you see then how sort of these transition maps fit together. And the classical co-cycle condition is this thing here, that G alpha beta composed with G beta uh, gamma is the same as G alpha gamma. The point is that the suggestion we now are coming up with uh, or is to replace a vector space by a two vector space. I'll get back to that later on, which is basically a two category. And then when you have two morphisms, you replace this co-cycle condition by a two morphism, H alpha beta gamma. Of course, the, you first need to know what is a two vector space. And the definition that my colleague, this is joint work with uh, my colleague John Rognes and Björn Dundas, and um, the definition that we sort of prefer to use is the one introduced uh, by Kapanov and Vyvotsky, where you basically, let me see, are there any, do these uh, work? Uh, okay, let me see. Basically, if you let V, you sort of the category of complex vector spaces. What you do is that you look at V mod, sort of modular categories over V. So you sort of copy the definition of a complex vector space by replacing the complex numbers by the category of complex vector spaces. So in a way, what is then a two vector space? One way to put it is that free modules of this kind would be V to the N. So these are categories and the morphisms, so these are the objects, and the morphisms would be functors from, say, Vn to Vm, and uh, the two morphisms would be natural transformations. If you co coordinateize this, you may say that at a, as a, at a skeletal level, this would just be the objects, would be n and m, positive integers, and what would the morphisms be? They would be matrices of vector spaces. So a morphism from N to M would be an N by N matrix of vector spaces. 
and composition by multiplication defined by direct sums and tensor products. And the two morphisms would be a matrix Tij, where these would be linear transformations between uh, the vector spaces in the two matrices. Of course, one could coordinatize this one more level, and here just end up with uh, the dimensional matrices. And these are just positive matrices. There. So that is the notion that we are going to use. The problem is that uh, we would like to form an object in order to do vector bundles, something like GLN of V, where V is now sort of the category of vector spaces. How do we do that? That is a non-trivial thing to do. But I'll come back to that later on. So with this motivation in mind, this is what I mean, mean by a two-vector space. I'll go directly to the definition of what I call second-order play theory. Let's suppose that we are given a topological space with a nice covering. I don't want nice, practicable, and also uh, an ordered covering uh, indexed by an ordered set. So a chartered two-vector bundle consists of a series of three things. E alpha beta is a family of matrices of vector bundles uh, U alpha over U alpha beta, which is the intersection of U alpha and U beta, such that when you look at each point at the dimensional matrices, these are invertible in the sense that they have determinant plus or minus one. Then we also have an n by n matrix of vector bundle isomorphisms from E alpha beta times E beta gamma to E alpha gamma, such that they realize this isomorphism here. So that just comes from matrix multiplication. So again, fiber-wise, in a sense, uh, we do have sort of a space here, and we look at the neighborhood here, and up here we just then have U alpha cross Vn. This could be expressed in some kind of uh, stack language, but for our purposes, that's not really necessary. So the fiber over each point is a category, if you like, namely a free V module of rank at N. So then we uh, have a third condition that is basically the three uh, cycle condition uh, that really is forced upon you that this diagram commutes, where this A is just the coherent associativity laws, the law that we have in uh, vector spaces. By the way, there are several, uh, some serious mistakes in the paper by Kapranov and Wotsky, but they all turn out to be repairable. So the problem one is faced with here is that if B is a symmetric bimonoidal category, uh, in order to form the general linear group, everything would be nice if we just could uh, take and make uh, plus invertible. Because, you know, here we are looking at positive matrices, and of course there are not many invertible of them. Basically, just the permutation matrices, and that doesn't give you a very interesting theory. But the point is that if you enlarge things and loosen up, and you look at sort of invertibility up to homotopy, things become quite different and more interesting. And here, it would be very tempting just to look at the group completion here and uh, apply the Grotendieck construction with respect to direct sum. And uh, several clever people have put uh, papers on the archives recently doing that, but forgetting one thing, that if you are in a bimonoidal category and you sort of group complete with respect to direct sum, you destroy the tensor product. And that was something that uh, Thomason pointed out right, sometimes in the 80s, but it has been forgotten. And that is really the complication here. So one has to be very careful in how, how you do the group completion here. 
So we form, say, in this bimonoidal category, we form the matrices, and then we define a GLN object, or what we call weakly invertible matrices, which is basically making these matrices here invertible up to homotopy. Let me just illustrate if these were ordinary rings, say the integers, positive integers, and z. Then, of course, we have an inclusion here. We have the general linear group over z. And then we do the pullback here. That's how we define GLN of n. And basically, we do the same thing for a category, just that we project down to GLN of pi naught of b, which is a ring. And we group completely the ring, and then we take the pullback. And that construction is sort of a mineral way to, to make uh, sort of a GLN B object. Then we define, and this is sort of a new definition that the algebraic K theory of this bimonoidal category is what we get by taking a special bar construction that determines everything by its two simplices of GLN B. Then we take the nerve of this, disjoint union. And then this omega b is what in topology is called the group completion. This is a bar construction and then delooping it. This makes the whole thing into the group. So this is a kind of uh, the way I think you're forced to do things because now we are replacing actually uh, complex numbers by a category. So it's a non-trivial step and it takes some care to justify this definition. Now the question is uh, how to sort of represent the chartered vector bundles that I presented to you. So I'll um, introduce a notion of represented two vector bundles. They consist basically of the following data that we have uh, sort of transition maps from U alpha beta to in this case, the nerve of our general linear group. These are homotopies, in a sense, going on triple intersections into uh, the nerve of uh, the isomorphisms, which we define as, as the morphisms in this category here. And then we have a rather co cycle condition, which corresponds to the one that we had for the matrices in the chartered definition. When you look at these things, these are sort of really forced upon you. So we have these two notions then of chartered two vector bundles and represented two vector bundles. And of course, we'd like to connect the two. And um, what we have is then that uh, chartered two vector bundles, then up to some kind of equivalence relation is actually then the same as when you look at homotopy classes from X into this different union of BGLN of D. So it's uh, very analogous to what we get. I mean, if V is just a complex vector space, like, I mean, we put C in here, then we just get uh, the different union of B of GL, the ordinary linear linear group. Um, this then, basically what we can show is that this gives us a cohomology theory represented by the following spectrum. Namely, the algebraic K theory of the bimonoidal category of complex vector spaces. And it's a rather lengthy argument to show that this is the same as, and this I think is the basically new result that you take topological K theory and make it connective. That's represented by a spectrum called KU. This is sort of a ring spectrum up to homotopy. So it makes sense to take the algebraic K theory of that and you produce another spectrum. So if you take sort of uh, the catchy way to phrase this is that if you take algebraic K theory of topological K theory, you get the representing spectrum of this new second order K theory. Furthermore, there's a notion in homotopy theory that is called chromatic filtration, that you sort of 
divide sort of homotopy theoretic phenomena into several levels coming from basically complex cobordism. And ordinary cohomology has chromatic filtration zero. It takes care of certain basic phenomena. K-theory has what's called chromatic filtration one, uh, where, for example, bot periodicity is a filtration one phenomenon. The second order K-theory has chromatic filtration two. And that means that it qualifies homotopy theoretically as a model of elliptic cohomology. Because elliptic cohomology, which is defined in various ways and very closely connected with string theory, has chromatic filtration too. And Michael Atiyah has been asking for quite some time that he wanted to have a definition of uh, elliptic cohomology in terms of bundles. And I think, in a way, the closest you get to defining elliptic cohomology by some kind of bundles is by using two-vector bundles. Of course, you have this infinite hierarchy here where complex cobordism, represented by the MU spectrum, has infinite uh, chromatic filtration. In between, you have the so-called Morawa K theories and some of these theories with singularities that Dan Sullivan and I constructed a long time ago. However, there are, uh, we used the definition that I sketched roughly here by Kapranov and Vygotsky of a two vector space. Uh, there is also another definition by John Baez on the market, which is an internal definition. He basically says that a two vector space is a cap object in vect. And it sounds very nice, and I spoke to him at length about a year ago, and immediately where we have to do K theory and group filtration, he gets inverses immediately. And that sort of got me very, to become very skeptical to this thing. It's a very slick and nice definition, but you see, he proves then that the ca his category of two vector spaces basically is two equivalent to two term, which means sort of uh, chain complexes this or, or consisting of two terms. But you see, if you then just take the homology of these groups, you can easily see, well, it takes a few pages to prove it, that that basically gives you two copies of the general linear group. So therefore, what I proved recently, we just finished it last week, is that if you look at the corresponding K theory of John Baez, this actually turns out to be two copies of ordinary K theory. So you get nothing new at all. Um, that's a little bit surprising, I think, to some people, but I think that his definition is much too internal. Uh, because in another way, when you do sort of a module construction, even in the category theoretical sense, you get outside of the category where you have been operating, and I think the hopes to get something new uh, is much better. So, um, um, the techniques used here are, are sort of quite involved, and um, we have written it up as sort of a general argument showing where sort of, you know, the problem here was the invertibility. So if, if you easily can form sort of have a monoid here, then easily you get back to Bayes' type situation and you get nothing new, you just ordinary case theory. But if you don't have sort of on the nose a, mono, uh, um, a group weed, um, and you have to group complete it, then uh, something new happens from a homotopy theoretic point of view. So at least um, I think uh, from what I understand uh, his notes in, uh, a, a, from the Ross Street conference this summer, he, I think he indicated that this would be a model of elliptic cohomology, but it is not just ordinary case theory. So, 
This is, uh, was one type of uh, application, uh, example of use of higher uh, categories, uh, two categories. And uh, you see here um, in this situation, we started out with V, which is sort of a bi uh, monoidal category. And we formed V mod. But then what we basically did is that we formed this, you may say that we formed passed to K of V mod. And this then became the ring object. So in the sense that we could iterate it mod one more time. And you see, when we did that, it seemed like taking care of all the coherences involved, it would sort of be a combinatorial explosion. But I think that we have uh, a way of keeping track of the coherences such in such a way that this can be iterated. And that means that it would pave the way for nth order K theory, that we can define n vector spaces, and that this would correspond to chromatic uh, filtration equal to n. Because it seems, there is a sort of an old conjecture in algebraic K theory that each time you apply K or something of chromatic filtration n, you should increase the chromatic filtration by one. And this seems to fit that conjecture. But this we haven't written up yet. Some details are, uh, well, I think basically it's true, but uh, it has to be written up. So therefore, this uh, has, from a homotopy theoretic point of view, an interesting perspective, uh, whether it would give interesting models of cohomology theories related to phenomena in physics, like elliptic cohomology does, I don't know. Let me then switch to another area where I've been working on recently, is in string theory and what's called string topology. Um, there's also, uh, we heard briefly yesterday, about sort of a two categorical object there. Um, Ulrike Tillman defined a long time ago a two category that she called S, where the objects are circular, incoming and outgoing circles. The morphisms are surfaces connecting the two with a certain genus. And the two morphisms are diffeomorphisms of the surface. This uh, keeping the boundary fixed. And she proved a very nice result that when you look at the group completion, basically, this is the same as omega b of s. Sometimes yeah, both notations are in use. Uh, you will get z cross b of um, that is B plus, which is the mapping class group, which is associated to uh, two-dimensional surfaces. And then this was then connected to this very nice result by Matson and Weiss, and they proved that this is the same as omega infinity of a space called CP minus one infinity. This space is basically what you get when you take CP infinity and you look at the canonical line bundle, and then you take its orthogonal complement, and you take the torm space of that, and then make it into a spectrum. That's what this space is. So that means you have a homotopy equivalence between these two spaces. And that was actually more than what was needed to prove the Mumford conjecture about uh, the cohomology of the mapping class. So this equivalence here is, I think, one of the nicest pieces of mathematics done within the last five years. However, from a two category point of view and from string theory, you would also like in this picture to enclose, to include open strings. So you'd like to have a category where the objects would be closed and open strings, and open strings being closed intervals. So here we have four incoming circles, two incoming intervals, producing one circle and one interval. So you see, this is part of a boundary component. This is open here. You can put your finger in here. This is a hole, a genus, and this is just sort of cutting out a disk. 
So this is what we call a window. So the green things, this free part of the boundary you get here, that's what corresponds to what's in physics is called debrates. And they have to be labeled. That is important. Uh, labeled, in this case, by a set B. So then recently, together with Ralph Cohen and a student of his, um, we proved the following result, that if you put all this together, we have that the topology, in a sense, and Okay, let me comment on one of these pictures that David Caulfield showed us yesterday about uh, something connected to string theory and Frobenius algebra. So it was a very complicated picture. And of course, pictures like that are very complicated, but they're all, it's like doing topology before you had homology groups. Because if you fit all these together, the topology of the category of open and closed strings with B, the D brains labeled by this set B, its topology is completely determined as follows. It's omega infinity, or CP minus infinity, plus a certain product, same number as the colors of the D brains, and this QP of CP plus infinity. And Q is this uh, suspension and looping structure that's commonly used in, in um, homotopy theory. On the other hand, it's the same as these product of Z, this cross the mapping class group, now extended with B, namely meaning uh, diffeomorphisms as two morphisms preserving this new kind of boundary structure. And the point is that all these Zs correspond to group completions. That's how they come up. Um, so this, I think, shows that two categories, I mean, often in text you see two categories treated, but sometimes when you really look at them geometrically and look at their topology, the topology is extremely intricate and uh, complicated. But uh, I think that makes it quite interesting. So even for surfaces, you have this, uh, I would say, quite uh, interesting topological result. But it all basically goes back, the deep point is really the step made by Matson and Weiss here. Let me see, did I have, did I run out of transparencies at this point? So let me just, um, I won't continue for long. So these were sort of my basic two uh, messages. Let me advocate one further point to you that I will call surface cohomology. But, so K-theory, I'll argue, should be called path cohomology. Why? This goes back actually to Graham Siegel's uh, Bourbaki note, I think it was in 89, where Siegel said that when we look at the path category of a space, and we look at functors into vect. That's basically vector bundles with a flat connection. And in a sense, when you look at functors of this kind, suitably treated, that gives you k of x. Because what you do, you take the nerve of p of x, you get the space back, you take the nerve of vects, that's basically du, uh, the infinite space, and then you group complete, and that gives you z plus pu. Okay. So let's accept Siegel's argument for a while. So if we then have this picture here, P of X, into vect, then we have this surface, even let me just write it, S of X, and I would claim that these two categories, geometrical two categories, when you want to represent them, basically what you do is, when you describe two vector bundles, is to have them into two vector, two vector spaces. So this was kind of the uh, Siegel. And Ulrike Tillman, she basically looked at representations into vect. What I just described in 2K theory, that was uh, 
was looking at representations of the path category into two vect. But the real thing to do would be to look at full representations of this two category into that two category. So by taking the nerve construction, uh, okay, so let me see. You see. This needs a parametrized version of the Mutz and Weiss theorem. And apparently, my conjecture is that this would correspond to a cohomology theory based on where the representing spectrum is K of KU to the power of CP minus one infinity. And this looks like a horrible spectrum, but I think uh, Christiana Sony and Tilman Bauer uh, in Bonn and Münster basically have computed, for example, the homology of these things. And it would be nice because that would sort of, uh, I mean, the set of functors, what I mean, corresponding to representations in the same way as the representations here would give us this uh, surface cohomology. So I think basically that this is true, though it hasn't been proved. And I think it would put both K-theory and this into uh, uh, a more geometric perspective. So that was one final thing. Um, OK, so secondly, or well, at the end, I would like to have some comments on higher categories. Because, as was pointed out last night, uh, there are several definitions of higher categories. And uh, personally, I think my point of view is that one should start by making sense of what is the n-dimensional cobordism category. What would that mean? That would mean that the top objects are manifolds with boundaries edges and corners. So I'll advocate that and nobody has done that, I claim. Describe this structure carefully. In this theory on cobordism with singularities, we developed sort of a notion of decomposed manifolds, which is close to this. I'd like to spread that stretch that out also to include corners and edges. And I would say that if you do that carefully and describe this as a structure, I think any definition of an end category should include that as an example. If this is not included in whatever definition you come up with as an end category, my point of view would be forget it. So that is one thing. And I think also sometimes geometrically n-fold categories may also, where instead of two morphisms like this, you consider two morphisms with squares. I think that also geometrically sometimes is just as interesting. And certainly sometimes you may do just with uh, also multi-simplicial sets. I think multisimplicial sets, in a way, are quite nice. And I think, sort of intuitively, to me, they play the role of a kind of Euclidean spaces. And then you look for sub-things of uh, multisimplicial sets. Uh, and they would correspond to kind of surfaces and manifolds. And that would be, uh, for example, among them would be n-fold categories and n categories. But they have the nice property that you can, for example, do nerve constructions easily because you just have n categorical directions which you realize one at a time. So uh, they're quite nice, actually. But still, I think the n cobordism category is a basic thing to be formulated uh, carefully. And uh, there's a good reason that it's not in the literature because it isn't easy. Um, also, I think maybe one possibly could relax conditions a little bit. And this is something that I've been interested in, in sort of when you glue things geometrically. Uh, okay, let's see something like this. 
and we would glue on like that. You see, normally you require in such gluings that here you have source and target, and the source and target here, and that these two should be the same. But geometrically, whether these circles go in and out are completely non-interesting, because whether you put on some kind of orientations, you can always adjust that by duality. So I think it's a more fruitful point of view to view these cobordisms just as bonds, geometric bonds among these circles. And you can adjust orientations easily. So this is basically morphism from the empty set to these. And that's what I would like to call a geometric bond. And I think that, in a way, and um, <laughs> I should admit that talking to category theorists, telling them to forget about source and target is like swearing in the church. <laughs> but I once did that, mentioned this at a meeting, uh, I think it's, uh, it was in Portugal, uh, where Maclean's 90th birthday was celebrated. And I thought he, he came up to me afterwards and I thought, now I'm going to hear hear some bad words, but he said, well, he thought that was quite an interesting point of view. So I was quite pleased by his reaction. But anyway, so this is something that I think can be done and I have formalized into a notion that I call hyperstructures, which is motivated, and this was what I talked about in, in Amiens at the Erisman meeting, and uh, I think it's useful from two points of view, namely to do geometric gluing in a free way and also in lots of other examples where, where you want to model what's commonly called higher order structures. And I recently, for example, been talking to uh, some of my friends doing uh, nanotechnology where one now is able to realize very complicated uh, geometric configurations that one didn't even conceive of realizing uh, 10 years ago. But often there's a need to describe what do we mean, for example, in condensed matter physics then by a higher order structure. And then you can't uh, formulate things in, a, in too complicated ways with coherent laws and everything. You have to relax some of these structures a little bit, and that's what this is an attempt about. But, so I think, in a way, the two points of view, for certain applications, I think a relaxed notion like this hyperstructures is needed to capture the essence of what we intuitively understand by a higher order structure. Secondly, if you want to do more precise mathematical arguments, we need a notion of higher categories. And I think, again, the n-dimensional cobordism category ought to be the guiding example. That's my message. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bass. Uh, yes, question. Uh, just a question about the, the last point about forgetting about uh, source and target. And uh, uh, what would happen with identity? We just would get rid of the identity? Or? No, I'll keep the identity. But uh, there's no contradiction. You see, for example, uh, you see, when uh, people, what one approach to higher categories is through what's called globular sets, where you have sort of a hierarchy, you have source and target, you go down one level, etc., down to the bottom level, x naught by source and targets. But also, you like to have the identity map going up here. I would replace that by. Uh, another sequence, x uh, naught. I'd also have the identity maps up here, but here I'll go down to basically the power set of x n minus 1 and the power set of x n minus 2, etc. It's like vibration? Uh, no, 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 it's not like vibrations. It's just that I, instead I would just assign uh, the, I mean, uh, Instead of source and targets, I would take assign this family of circles that would constitute the boundary. So geometrically, 
instead of saying uh, one circle being the source and another the target, just the whole collection. Because to distinguish them is just sort of a matter of orientation, and that can be done later on by duality arguments. Yeah, it's maybe trivial what I'm saying, but exactly that is what is captured by the notion of compact closed category, that you can just put everything at the same side. Uh, pardon me, I didn't quite understand that. The, the last idea which you have, that you can, com com for example, forget completely forget about sources and just consider everything as a target just by pulling it over. Yeah, that's, yes, that's yes, intrinsically yes. in the notion of compact closed category, because compact closed functor is completely determined by its action on elements, like on things from the multiplicative units to whatever this completely determined yeah, yeah, yes, yes 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 uh, and i think even as i mentioned to you yesterday this one dimensional picture i mean you can extend it i mean just also to for example a disc yes where you go from just from the identity to yeah. so to speak anything yes well it's basically that you don't need boxes you can do everything with triangles <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 right As tomorrow, I have to speak to um, some people, including Pierre Shapiro, who, who told me he's, he's rather skeptical of the need to go beyond by categories. Um, so, I mean, you're telling us some evidence for going beyond. I mean, what do you think of the, is the is the best evidence that we need to go up to try categories? Well, to, to me, the best evidence would be if you can prove new mathematical results that are interesting to the mathematical community. Uh -huh. So, I mean, if you can uh, use introduce n vector spaces and n vector bundles and we can pick up some new topological information there to me i think that's uh, absolutely okay. sufficient justification right i can't see there should be any moral <laughs> issues involved not going beyond two uh, no I, I think they would be on strictly mathematical uh, intellectual grounds I mean, there's no mysticism in this business. It's, uh, I, I think, to me, I mean, n categories, you see, when you do things, the ground field always only appears, for example, in vector spaces at the top level. So all the lower levels from zero to n minus one are purely combinatorial. And I think the point is that uh, n categories is as I see it now, a very efficient way to keep track of very tricky and involved combinatorics. And we need sometimes a kind of machinery to do that. Uh, you see, I, I think like, uh, it's like, um, or, or in general about higher order structures. Uh, I, I think mentally we are not sort of very good at keeping track of several levels at the same time. And I think, for example, Arthur Kessler, who wrote some very nice things about hierarchies in his book Janus said that, okay, human beings, we basically may be able to keep track of three levels. That's the level where we are, the level above, and the level below. And apart from that, <laughs> we need some kind of uh, formalism to take care of it. And I mean, it, so, so I think beyond the theory of higher categories, I think higher structures, and what I refer to as hyperstructures, which I think I mentioned to you once, uh, is interesting because we need some kind of formalism to keep track, keep track of that, even in a non-mathematical modeling sense. And uh, it's like the, in logic, for example, you know about, you talk about jokes, and then you ha can have a joke about a joke. That's a sort of second order joke. And a joke about a joke about a joke, that's a third order joke. And fourth order, a joke about a joke about a joke, no longer is a joke. <laughs> so, okay. This is, just, uh, this is just a technical question, but in your first part of your talk, you started off by building vector spaces and you needed the multiplicative and the additive tensor, and then you also wanted, uh, I think, so what, what part of the vector space structure do you need? You, pro you, pro you need distributivity of one over the other. Yes, but... but what but, more do you need, really, of the vector space structure? Well, you only have sort of... You don't have strict distributivity, only up to isomorphism. Yes, yes, okay, that's yes. what I mean. So, you need so, distributivity so, isomorphism. But. Right, right. Uh, and that's a bit subtle, and it's difficult to keep track of, of these, these coherences. 
so, 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 so that is the basic uh, problem. And you see, then, when you want to, to group complete in order to enrich the invertible matrices, so to speak, in order to get an interesting theory, then if you sort of in, invert direct sum, you introduce minus vector spaces, mm -hmm. then you screw up the multiplication tensor product. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a very subtle point. And then, if you want to then go beyond two vector spaces and take, take V mod, mod again, you have to do the same thing over again. And then, I think we have a mechanism where we sort of can keep track of the coherences in such a way that it doesn't explode, and meaning that the process can be iterated. But, I mean, there's not sort of a specific point. I mean... The, 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 the yeah, my question was actually how much do you rely on the fact that you start off with vector spaces and not just with like two monoidal structures and distributivity isomorphism so like to, how, 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 how strong is the, the need for having a vector full vector space, space structure underlying like instead of saying uh, modules over a ring or something much weaker no, I mean, I, I mean, it's just you have, I mean, uh, any bi symmetric bi monoidal category. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I wrote that. I mean, oh. yes. Yeah, so, 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 I mean, okay. For example, you may just take, I mean, the bi monoidal category of, of finite sets. If you do that, we come up with algebraic K theory of the sphere spectrum, which is a over point of Walthausen's A theory. So, even in that case, finite sets gives interesting results. Yes. Yeah, so any, yeah.